an identity is a pattern of thinking, feeling, speaking, and doing. Language or speaking and thinking being somewhat synonymous. And an identity between an individual and its environment or an identity exists in the intersection of the individual and its environment. And the question that I begin with outside the set is what happens when a language dies? What happens when a cult dies? There have been an estimated 10,000 cults or cultures in human history. Each has a language. Each has a, a paradigm, an emphasis in response to a larger stage of the environment at a given time. Cultures formed in response to large natural disasters have a traumatically oriented identity, have a cult that emphasizes in the narrative, in the mythology of the cult, uh, something that allows the people in that cult to survive that given environment. If we look at the probability field of the human psyche. The cult that we occupy, the cult that we are in, is a very small part of that larger probability field. And what happens when a cult dies? A cult dies in part because of its fixation on a status quo. All cults, to one degree or another, are self-referential. Meaning, if we ask about the American cult and look at the memes or common practices that maintain the norm, you might look at the phenomena of being asked multiple times a day by uh, a wide array of acquaintances to strangers, how are you? And the response, I'm fine. Is a cult with a higher suicide rate than the number of people that die in traffic accidents, a, a pretty high st statistic, I think we're at 400,000 deaths in the United States, is a cult that has more suicides than traffic accidents filled with individuals that are really doing fine. And partly to understand that, we look at the bell curve around suicide. At the very tip of the bell curve, you have the number of actual suicides, which in recent years is on the increase. And if you look at the bell curve of species on the planet, we are part of a very small minority of mammalian Am, you know, human animals that actually take their own lives. It's unusual to find a bird committing suicide. For the most part, rats don't commit suicide. Badgers, as far as I know, don't commit suicide. The only animal I'm aware of that at times commits suicide are the tarsier monkeys in the Philippines. And these highly sensitive creatures that like 
an incredible stillness which they enjoy in their natural habitat are harassed uh, every year by tourists who are attracted to one of the smallest monkeys in existence. Little monkey about this size. And because of the dissociation between the speed, the regulation or of pace around which the tarsier is in its optimal environment, in the intersection of noise, flash photography, and crowds, tarsier monkeys are among the few animals to commit suicide in response to the violation of the people who come to take their picture. In the millions of species on the planet, there are a very small number that commit suicide, and the human animal is on that list. So it's a very small number. And something pretty major has to happen for this deviation to occur from the status quo. Now, if you look at the tip of the bell curve of suicide, the number of people who successfully take their own life in the hundreds of thousands per year, right behind them is a number of, let's say, a hundred times more that are planning suicide. Perhaps they will be unsuccessful. Perhaps they don't get around to it. But it's a pretty enormous anomaly in the probability field of life that individuals of a species would be in so much pain, primarily psychologically, but uh, also physically, that they would prefer death, facing that fear of the unknown, a peak human fear in a traumatic culture, that they would face the fear of death rather than endure the cult and the cult environment uh, provided that they've been born into. Men do it more than women. And older men in the United States do it more than younger men. A white middle-aged man is a prime candidate for suicide in our culture. So why does everyone say that they're doing fine? It's a meme. It is a cult norm. It's not honest. It's not intelligent. It's just what we do. And it's these things that we do them because we do them, and we do them because other people do them, and other people do them because other people before them did them, that creates the cult-like nature of culture. Every cult in human history of the estimated 10,000 cults believes, acts as if its way of doing things is the only intelligent way to do things. And yet, what are the odds? What are the odds if you were going to bet that your cult out of 10,000 is the best one? And we don't even ask this question. It's striking that one can go through a complete education in one's cult without comparing relative well-being 
to cult norms and practices of other cults. There's at least 600 of the 10,000 cults in human history in some, some semblance of life on the planet today. Cults tend to correlate with language. Language gives rise to thought. Thought gives rise to consciousness. It's very difficult to be conscious of something for which there is no language. When a, when a word is unemphasized and dies, the thought, the consciousness associated with that word dies with it. For every person who commits suicide, a hundred more are making preparations. Many won't complete it. Many will fail at the attempt. Many will get distracted along the way. But the tale behind a suicidal victim is enormous. You have the one who carries out the plan. You have a hundred more that are planning. And you have a thousand more that are thinking about it from time to time. Life is so painful. Maybe I'd be better off dead. And this meets resistance in the body that naturally wants to live. It meets the fear of the unknown. It meets the shame in a cult that shames death and views death as a failure as opposed to a liberation. It shames those who think about suicide. And so if you take the actual deaths and multiply them by a hundred thousand, you start to gain a picture of the invisible body of people that are in so much pain that their best way of solving it, so much chronic pain, that their best way out within a given cult is to actually destroy their own body. And yet, in the meme of move on, be positive, don't focus on the negative, how are you doing, I'm fine, we obscure this data as part of our cult emphasis. Every cult has a bias. And the American cult, among other things, is defined by certainly a cynicism, but a tough it out, move on, move forward, and don't examine the pain, which is, of course, a recipe for that pain continuing and uh, expanding. Now every cult has its biases. Every cult has its segment carved out. And for illustration on a video, I've made the segment of the cult, the box, much bigger in the probability field of the psyche than it actually is because we can't look at drawings were we to take a circle of probability. The probable cults have all existed or exist on the planet today. On the way over to the Americas, I believe it was the Spanish influenced by uh, the churches of the day, uh, the Catholic Church primarily, that came across the islands in the Dominican 
And one of the things that they discovered was a matriarchal culture in which they were greeted warmly, in which policemen were unnecessary, in which rape and incest were incredibly rare, a cult of domestic harmony. The women owned the house and invited male lovers into their lives. At times, it was in many ways a more civilized cult than our cult today in which one in three domestic partners will experience domestic abuse. And it was discovered as part of the hospitality extended to our ancestors, it was discovered that they had gold. And upon writing back to their king and their church, they were admonished to secure as much gold as possible, to turn the natives into slaves with threat and exacted rape and execution. One of the habits was to cut off the soles of the feet or amputate an arm of the natives who had welcomed them for not meeting the, co the quota of gold in a protocol of slavery to send back to Europe. driving the natives to the bone, constant demands from European power structures for more gold faster led to the execution of more than 90% of this population and the severe trauma of the rest when 90% of your culture is beheaded, is amputated, is raped, and 100% of your culture is destitute, has witnessed the atrocities to the human being. We all have a reptilian brain. We all have a limbic brain. We all have the conscious, rational brain. We all have the empathic brain. And we all have the transcendent brain, the brain that is capable of moving beyond the individual narcissism of isolated self-obsession to be a part of something bigger. That brain lies within each of our bodies. The brain that is activated and the brain that we function from is determined largely by the environment. A sociopathic environment of violation, of dishonor, of emotional illiteracy, of traumatic illiteracy, of indecency triggers the fight, flight, freeze of the reptilian brain. And the individuals in that culture are reduced to functioning as reptiles, as the intersection of human need to survive, to feel secure in that survival, to have some sense of love and belonging, acceptance, tolerance, welcome, some sense of self-esteem, some sense of an opportunity to develop our human gifts, an ability to bring those gifts to community and contribute them to the world around us to generate the abundance that comes when a human being is allowed to share their innate gifts 
and to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Every human being has these drives in a hierarchy outlined in part by Abraham Maslow. And when in order to survive, when in order to increase one's odds of survival, one's sense of safety or security, one is faced with death or slavery, we reduce a population down to the reptilian brainstem. We take millions of years of human evolution and turn people into animals by demanding that in order to survive they must behave like animals. It is impossible to sustain a transcendent state of mind in the presence of reptiles who will exploit the empathy, the caring, the generosity of those around them, ensuring that anyone functioning with empathy has a lower chance of survival, a lower chance of security, a lower chance of fitting in than anyone functioning out of fear, out of the reptilian brainstem. Some of the Christian priests disturbed at the rape and butchering of empathic human beings who had a more enlightened civilization than our own wrote back to the church and asked for guidance and were told that these were not human beings and that the gold was more important than their lives, their dignity, and by extension, the dignity of the slave masters, of the rapists, of the church. It is impossible to do to another human being what one does not do to oneself. And part of the disease that was spreading at that time was the idea that the golden egg is more valuable than the goose. That these sailors, that these priests had no innate value that the only value that counted was the value bestowed by the cult, by the hierarchy, by the church, by the king. You were nothing, but you could be turned into something if you got an earldom, if you were knighted. And the way to be knighted was to become a sociopath in order to secure gold for the king, land for the king, slaves for the king, gold for the church, land for the church, slaves for the church. And in that paradigm, in the paradigm that says, I have no innate value as a human being, I am nothing, and I am treated in an abuse protocol like nothing by the dominant power structure of my cult. The only way to become something within that paradigm is to lose one's humanity. And they did. They gained earldoms they gained medals, they gained blessing by their church and their king for the rape, for the murder, 
of a people and of a cult that was more empathic, less sociopathic than our own, that was more symmetrical in the balance of masculine and feminine energy than our own, that was more sustainable, meaning that cult could live on their islands for a thousand years and not overpopulate it, not pollute it, not destroy it, and live in the empathic and at times transcendent regions of their brain in a symmetrical, symbiotic relationship with each other and the host body. That cult is no more. It's part of the principle of mass, which is at odds with the principle of intelligence. The majority in the history of humankind has never been correct. In the bell curve of intelligence, the bleeding edge of intelligence is always occupied by a minority. If you want to find the highest levels of intelligence on the planet at any given moment in history, you will look to a distinct minority who is generating more amount of sustainable well-being per unit of energy invested than any other group of people alive on the planet at that day. And so intelligence is nested in the minority. Mass is by definition in the majority. One of the ways that you can measure the intelligence of any cult is by how well they honor the diverse minority at their fringe. Because in the bell curve of change and growth, in order to live, in order to grow, every cult, every culture, every country must have divergent minorities that pioneer new technology of thought, new technology of uh, physical science, new technology of culture. These minorities hold the fragile egg of the future. The majority gives birth to divergent anomalies that hold the seeds of the future. If the majority holds on to the status quo too tightly and is too efficient at the execution and suppression of its minorities, it will gradually grow out of phase with the growing ecology around them. The geopolitical ecology, the economic ecology, the social and technological ecology and the rest of the world. A cult that stays fixated, be it a Christian cult, a Muslim cult, an American cult, any cult in history that stays fixed dies. And the reason for the ascension of new cults and new cultures and the death of the majority of the 10,000 cultures in our history is the inability to adapt, the inability to change the efficient killing off 
of the minority of divergent voices because the minority, by definition, is in opposition, is in tension with the majority. And the majority has the law of mass on their side. The majority can always exercise the law of mass to kill off the minority. The Jews were a minority in Germany. And Hitler and the German people exercised the right of mass, the law of mass, to kill off a people that could not, that can never defend themselves against a majority that is committed to murdering its future, to murdering its possibility. The countries and cultures that are friendliest to new ideas and innovation, new business startups, new relationships, new ways of thinking, new religions, new protocols for relating to the esoteric or the unknown, that are friendly to new innovations in science and new innovations in culture blossom. Homosexuality, divergent forms of sexuality, different races and their unique focuses either bring life to what is always a dying cult because a cult's contract with its people is a contract of certainty. Copy us, be like us, do like we do, and you will survive. You will feel secure. You will experience love and belonging, and you will have some semblance of self-esteem and honor. You will have that if you conform. If you do not conform, a healthy cult learns from the deviations. Nature is a healthy cult. Why are not all of the species alive that have ever been alive in nature? Because nature is always giving birth to anomalies. And some of those anomalies, among many, have an advantage. Some of those anomalies are more intelligent than the status quo. And those anomalies ascend in the hierarchy of nature and become the new majority until nature gives birth to a new anomaly a new distinct pattern that converts energy into survival and well-being more efficiently than the pattern before it. And in that way, nature is set up to win. Nature is set up as an ecology, as a diverse ecosystem of symbiotic relationships, constantly giving birth to new anomaly, constantly responding to shifts and cycles within the environment, and moving towards grace, moving towards balance. One of the qualities of a cancer is, first of all, the divergence from the organizational principle 
of its host body. The human body is created with millions of cells, billions of atoms, organized in a structure that is integrated. A healthy person will not use this hand to cut off the other part of the hand. There is a synergy, there is a cooperation within the complex structure. These minute parts form a part of something bigger. And when all of the individual parts of the human body function in service to the well-being of the body, the body prospers. And with it, each of the parts prosper as well. When the hand gives food to the mouth, the mouth sends food to the stomach, which sends nourishment to the hand. There's an ecology. Cancer is an anomaly. It's a breaking of the pattern to say, I'm going to grow in dissonance to my host body. I'm going to do my own thing. And of course, cancer is very alive. It's very dynamic. It rapidly spreads throughout the body, consuming its host more efficiently than the host consumes it. But the end of every cancer's journey is the death of its host body. And right after the host dies, every cell of cancer dies with it. That's the flaw. That's the message of the cancerous path of survival, security, abundance, out of sync with the host body of which we are a part. Every cult carves out a part of the probability field of the psyche and emphasizes that with paradigms and language in a capitalist cult, what is emphasized is capital. Did you make more money today than you made yesterday? Did I make more money than you? Did I make more money this year than I did last year? Am I buying more things? Am I uh, am I saving more money? Am I investing? The paradigm of capital is to turn money into more money and more money into more money and yet more money still. And we in a capitalist cult rank the wealthiest people in the cult in various lists. The Forbes 400 list, the wealthiest people, the Fortune 500, the biggest companies. We measure size, the size of a company capable of generating capital. We measure uh, GDP, gross domestic product. And if GDP is going up, be it with robots, be it by consuming forests, becoming more cancerous as we destroy our host body, be it by building bigger houses, or buying more cars, or driving more miles, or putting more CO2 into the atmosphere. The economy in a capitalist cult is doing good. It's improving. As the ecology falls apart, but we are not an ecological cult. 
And so there are no measures of the people who destroy more trees than any other tree, nor are there measures of the people who plant the most trees, nor are there measures or ranks for empathy and compassion. We don't have daily conversations in our cult to say, gee, death on the one hand, life on the other hand, this year are you more excited about living and less interested in dying than you were the year before. We don't measure the feminine terrain of well-being, which is why we are a capitalist cult and not an ecological cult and not a human cult and not a feminine cult. What one measures in the hierarchy, meaning when capital is the linchpin for survival, for security, for love and belonging and self-esteem and the opportunity to develop one's gifts, when capital is the linchpin, then it's not about whether a human being would like to create art or poetry or tell stories or bring smiles to children's faces. The question is what will make the most money? And this is the deciding point for going left, going right, going forward, going back in a thousand different ways a day that define who we are. And the tyranny of a cult is the vast regions of the psyche that are left empty, that are left unspoken, unseen, unframed, unacknowledged and dishonored. When a paradigm does not exist to hold the framework to draw attention to part of who we are as conscious beings, that part of us enters the unconscious, becomes part of the shadow, dark or light, that is not talked about, that is not seen. And part of each one of us dies with that process. And when the cult is more cancerous, then it is healing and wholesome. When a cult is more violent to large regions of the psyche that are anesthetized with unconsciousness. You see, when you inject Novocaine into a cheek, you can bite that cheek to a bloody pulp and feel nothing. It doesn't exist. It's numb. It's unconscious. And part of the brutality of totalitarian cults, cults that are hostile to divergence within self and within others, we call these cults extremists. We are extreme in rationalist, reductionist, scientific materialism. And in the production of choice, studies have shown that increasing a human's choice beyond a certain amount decreases their well-being because it's not clear whether it's the best one. 
Another version of this is the distinction between satisfiers and maximizers. The people who are always trying to get the best house, the best car, at the best price, are statistically more miserable than the people who maybe pay 10% more on average, but are focused in a paradigm of, it's good enough, the house. Let's focus on the family. This car is adequate. Let's focus on where we're going. The satisfier temperament pays a little more, gets a little less, and is happier. Certain choices laid out in tradition similarly produce more well-being than the anxiety that in a freedom cult it's all about being free. I've got to be free to wear whatever I want to wear, to eat whatever I want to eat, to do whatever I want to do. But with this becomes, there comes an overwhelming sense of choice with that drive to be better, to be more, to choose the right thing, to get the most out of every day. But if I do this, I can't do that. If I go to this restaurant, I can't go to this other one. Which is the right one? To get the most out of every day. There's a misery. If you're eating over here, maybe it was better over there. If you're moving into your house, oh, I don't like those neighbors. I wonder if the neighbors were better in that other house that we could have bought. One isn't enough. We've got to get more. Work harder. Get more. Raise the income. Get more done faster. This does not lead to well-being. And yet we want it. In a freedom cult, freedom in many ways is elevated above what we actually do with that freedom. We can say we're a free country, but with growing obesity and 90% of Americans using that freedom to spend a majority of their discretionary time in front of screens, busily trying to decide which is the best of all the 100,000 bits of media to consume in a day, is there more well-being than a Native American stepping out of a teepee, surveying the weather, present to their body, without a single choice of media to consume? There are conversations inside each one of us that want to take place. And yet, identity cannot exist without a circle. Where does the last Indian go for their burial service when no one is there to be the counterpart of the grief ritual? Where does the anomalous child that is captivated by a sense of music around the flight of a butterfly go when not one person in their circle understands the joy of that moment? because it has nothing to do with capital, nothing to do with GDP. We pay lip service to living well, but we dedicate our lives to the preparation for, the training for, the acquisition 
and the spending of capital. Americans dislike their job to the tune of 78%, and yet they spend more time preparing for going to and from work and working than they spend doing anything else. Every unsustainable cult collapses because a cult is a heuristic set of programs and every cult perpetuates itself with a certain amount of dogma that says if you will do this and if you will do that you will have everything that is important as defined by us. We've all agreed that this is what's important and if you do this and this and this you will have more of what's important, more money perhaps than the generation before. When that promise starts to collapse, the contract of the status quo comes under pressure because while every cult provides the tremendous service of certainty and protection from the unknown and a reduction in thinking, a reduction in consciousness, it takes effort to be conscious. It takes very little effort to copy and fit in. While every cult provides a high dose of effortless copying and unconscious normalcy, the peak levels of well-being never exist in the majority of any cult. It's not how the bell curve works. In time, attention grows as people have survival, security with certainty, some sense of love and belonging, some sense of self-esteem, and are continually asked to sacrifice the many unique regions of their own psyche in order to fit in, the status quo loses some of its charm. And so you have the outcasts and you have at times the very wealthy within a cult that start diverging that start blossoming into a minority position. How do you have a conversation that wants to be born when there's not a single person capable or willing to have that conversation with you. One option is to dissociate, to enter the inner world. In the inner world, freed from time and space, unbounded by cult dogma, one can travel the larger ecology of the human psyche, the larger ec ecosystem, the larger probability field. The possibility field of the human psyche is infinite. It contains a hundred million cults that have never been born yet, that are more intelligent than our own. In the efficiency of transforming energy, time, money, and natural resources into sustainable well-being. The probability field is all that has been. It was certainly possible that human beings encountering a more feminist culture 
in their search for gold might wake up and say, you know, I'd rather be around nice people without violence in tropical beauty than be an earl in a chauvinistic abuse cult where as long as I pay fealty to the top of the hierarchy, I'm knighted. But as soon as I'm an inconvenience, I'm executed, I'm rounded up, I'm not invited to the party. Maybe I'd rather live here. The law of mass and the intelligence of the majority, meaning a low level of intelligence in the majority, and a high level of trauma in the majority, always results in the persecution and execution of a minority. Because the more traumatized you are, the more frightened you are of the unknown. The more frightened you are of the unknown inside, re-encountering the traumatic terrain that lies waiting as the dragon within, the more terrified you are of the unknown other. And it is fear of the other, fear of diversity, that leads to murder. It is the fact that when you encounter another human being who is completely different than yourself. You must get to know a correspondingly different part of yourself in order to dialogue with the other. The mirror neurons and our nature to connect says that when we encounter the other, which represents 99.9% of the possibility field. 99.9% .9 of the possibility field is other than our cult, other than ourselves. That when we encounter the other, the first impulse of a traumatic or traumatized cult, which is defined by their fear of the unknown, is to kill it. The law of mass dictates that the majority, when two fear-based cults interact, will kill the minority. The law of mass dictates that when one empathic cult and one much larger sociopathic cult interact, the sociopathic cult will kill off the empathic cult in one of two ways. Either by reducing everyone in the empathic cult down to the reptilian brainstem with abuse, trauma, slavery, etc. Or if there's an unwillingness to come down to that level because the sociopathic reptilian brain is grit and survival. There's no joy in the reptilian brainstem. There's no higher function other than referencing technique of more efficient killing. The descent comes down by obliteration or integration at the lowest common denominator. The Incas invited their hosts in in a religious festival and were ambushed and slaughtered in a transcendent state. A hundred Buddhist monks, a hundred Tibetan monks cannot maintain as a small distinct minority the oppression of a Chinese military intent on rape, 
destruction of sacred objects, the slaughter of temples, the slaughter of texts, and the torture and torment of all that is holy in that culture and survive when the world decides to stand by and watch. Judith Herman, in her book, Traumatic Recovery, talks about the incentive of the bystander. If I violate you, and violation is a norm, and you ask for help, the bystander has a choice. The witness has a choice. On the one hand, they can side with the abused and stand up against oppression. On the one hand, the world could send aid and protection to Tibet, but that takes energy. On the other hand, it can stand by and watch the slaughter of a culture. That takes no energy. On the one hand, a woman who cries out on a darkened street because she's being raped could be rescued and the abuse could be stopped, which takes risk, courage, and effort. When the bystander does nothing, they conserve energy, and the rape continues. Traumatic pain is such that the victim demands that the bystander own their position, own their authority and their commitment to stand up for a more empathic world or to do nothing. And the culture recedes down to a more sociopathic level. The conflict of interest in a culture governed largely by the reptilian brain makes the outcome obvious. We stand and watch our homeless. We stand in silence as one in three of our women will be sexually molested before adulthood as one in four adult women will be raped. We stand in silence because the alternative is to spend energy. And when we're dissociated, because the reptilian brain is the most isolated of all the brains, the consciousness coming from the reptilian brain is a consciousness that is at war and that is in fear of every other living thing. And every expenditure of energy is experienced as a reduction in the odds that I will survive. Many of us live in the intersection between the reptilian brain and the more empathic brain and the question of whether we act sociopathically or empathically is driven primarily by the fear in relationship to the law of mass. I would stand up to you, my husband, and stop the rape of our daughter but you are bigger than me, and you have a gun. So I will let you rape my daughter. I would stand up to you, 
the boyfriend molesting my daughter. But you have money, and I understand that if I don't turn a blind eye, you will leave me and give that money to somebody else. And the daughter does not have the power to affect my survival in a sociopathic state as much as my abuser. Governments abuse mass constantly. The SWAT teams that rather than knocking on someone's door and politely leading an elderly woman outside so she doesn't have to deal with the trauma rather than courtesy, want to gain prestige in a cult of power, have got to bang down the door with machine guns, throw everyone on the floor, intimidate and dominate to seize some marijuana, whatever it is, because if they don't gain power with fear, in a sociopathic structure, the reptilian brain ceases to honor them. The reptilian brain is capable of honoring only fear. To gain a need for significance, a sense of honor, when dealing with sociopaths, Violence and domination is the language that the reptilian brain registers and pivots around. Fight, flight, freeze, or fawn are the four positions of the sociopathic reptilian brain. And governments rely a lot on fawning that if we show up with overwhelming force, we can terrify our victims, can terrify the reptilian brain into a fawning collusion with the abuser that mirrors the fawning collaboration that most abused children used to survive the protocol of abuse in American homes. There have been many conversations that I've wanted to have and no one to sit in the other chair. The dialectic of sympathy, antipathy, and synthesis, the coming together of opposites, requires a dialogue between two or more. It requires someone sitting in the other side of the chair. And the integration of two or more requires the witness requires the bifurcation of perspective. We have two eyes, two ears, and one of the reasons or thoughts is why not just have one bigger eye in the center? Because these two eyes, they both see if you put your hand here and then put your hand here, both eyes see things a little bit differently. And this is astounding because they're only six inches apart. And yet this eye doesn't see what this eye sees. When you bifurcate perspective, what you gain is dimension. When you look at the planet in Brazil and then look at the planet in Finland, 
you're looking at the same planet. But rather than six inches apart, you're thousands and thousands of miles apart. And so when you ask someone in Brazil, what's the temperature of this planet? Oh, high 80s, 90s. And then you ask someone in Finland, what's the temperature of this planet? 40 below zero, high 20s. You get two different readings. And it's only in the synthesis of those two perspectives that you get a third dimension. You get a fourth dimension, a fifth dimension. Because what we gain by having two eyes is a greater sense of depth perception as we synthesize two perspectives into one. Now chauvinism is predicated on splitting the world in two. It's part of our cult, deeply ingrained. Every American is a chauvinist by the time they have language, unless they do an extensive amount of deprogramming to defrag the body and put it together with a more symmetrical version of reality. Cults are self-referential. So when you say that a leader is more valuable than a follower, because everyone in your cult pays respect to a leader and jeers at a follower, The innate need to survive, feel secure, have a sense of love and belonging pivots the aspiration by the time we have language to want to lead and to feel something shameful about following, to want to teach but feel something shameful about learning, about not knowing, to want to speak but feel a certain weakness about listening to somebody else speak. And chauvinism is born when you bifurcate the whole into two counterparts that scientifically are equal in nature. You cannot teach without learning. You cannot learn without teaching. They're equal. What's the value of a teacher without any students? What's the value of a speaker without any listeners? A leader without any followers? A giver with no takers? There's no exchange. The value is in the exchange and in the synthesis of that exchange of energy. You cannot exchange and synthesize energy without the masculine and the feminine pole being functionally and optimally equally present. I say optimally because you do have a country of speakers with very few listeners. You don't have communication. You have a lot of talking and very little listening. You can have maybe 10% of the words get through but there are no courses in effective public listening. Those courses in a chauvinistic cult <clears throat> are reserved for effective public speaking. The masculine pole is biased. How can you synthesize with honor parts of your feminine psyche in a cult without a witness. You need the two counterpoints and you need the witness. And you need this at multiple levels. And I want to talk a little bit about meta and meta conversations because <clears throat> meta is the conversation about 
the conversation. Metta is the awareness about the awareness. And one of the things or one of the reasons that con consciousness is always expanding in its natural state is it creates new things out of old things through meta. Somebody creates a TV series, but that's not where the conversation in consciousness ends. Someone else watches the TV series and has a conversation about the TV series. But it's not the same conversation in the exact same perspective as the person sitting next to them, which watches the conversation, watches the TV series, and has a different perspective. So now you have the consciousness of the writers, the artists, the producers, the directors, all coming together. And then you have the, 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 the level of the commentator, the level of perspective, of observation, which is the intersection of those objects with the hierarchy of values, generally defaulting to the cult values, with the hierarchy of values, beliefs, and perspectives of the cult. But every person interprets it a little differently. So you now have a meta-conversation. And then you have a conversation about the conversation about the conversation. Now you have three levels of conversation. Now, meta is important because it's a process of zooming out. You have a TV series, a Seinfeld, which is about absolutely nothing. And then you have a conversation about what does it mean? What do you think about a TV series that's virtually about nothing? And then you have the conversation about the conversation. What do you think about people and the situation of people debating a TV series about nothing? And as you get higher up in the meta conversations, you begin to see your cult laid before you. If we stand back and look at the American cult, it's evening, this evening, we see hundreds of millions of Americans prioritizing their most precious resource, time, in digesting their media of choice. You are here. And on one level, it looks like we're very different. On one level, it looks like, well, this isn't Seinfeld. I'm watching Dane talk about whatever it is he's talking about, waiting for him to get to whatever point he's going to make. I'm there. I'm not watching Seinfeld. But when we start getting a little bit higher up, and what do we think about a culture of more and more isolated individuals consuming more and more divergent fragments of media through ears and eyes with an interest, an addictive draw for stimulation, for newness. I want something new. I want something crisp and new and fast. I want adrenaline. What do we think about a nation of adrenaline addicts that get their primary hits of newness, etc., through media pumped into devices. See, now 
we've unified the cult because 90% of people are doing just that. And then we can say, well, what do we think about, what about the Amish? They're not looking at screens right now. Are they doing polka dances? Are they feeding their horses? What do we think about that? Well, every cult is self-referential, so of course that would be foolish. We don't do that, and we don't do that because we don't do that. We all know that speed is good. We know that technology is good, and it's good because we know it's good, and we get more technology and faster technology and more pixels in our technology and bigger screens in our technology. We all know that's good because we all know that's good. Who do you think's feeling the most connected? The Amish or you and me? I created this framework out of a hunger for many conversations that I cannot have anywhere that I know in the world. And there are many things that die off because there's no soil in which to grow them. An orchid dies off in Alaska every single year and doesn't come back. The environment is hostile to an orchid in Alaska. There's something else there. Is it better? Is it worse? It's different. But what happens when our deepest longing is for the parts of ourselves to live that are being killed off every day? Is that why Taking our own life is preferable to watching who we want to become be systematically raped, downgraded, deranked, deprioritized, and murdered by the sociopathic regime of our cult. One of the technologies that I'm exploring, because I would say that for most of this life, I have had most of the most important conversations to me within myself, within myself, invisibly, in a cult that does not know that they are there. Because in our cult, men do not like to speak. So why would we listen? In our cult, men like football. So why would we ask a man to talk about ideas, to talk about feelings? See, part of what a cult does is it sets a frame in which every part of ourself that doesn't fit in that frame goes invisible. And it's not just that it goes invisible. When we are culturally illiterate, it is invisibly invisible. One of the beautiful things about traveling is when I go to Thailand, whole regions that are visible in the United States disappear. They're of no interest to the Thai people. But at the same moment, whole parts of my psyche that have lain dormant, that have been killed off through systematic neglect, shame, a lack of humility, a lack of imagination, a lack of empathy, whole frameworks come to life. Suddenly, I learn that the quality of my smile matters. 
not here, but in Thailand. And I discover a capacity to connect through the mirroring of a people in the land of smiles. When I stay in a hotel and 23 distinct staff members who have not seen me in 18 months greet me warmly by name with more courtesy and presence than every single interaction in my cult, I understand I'm in a new world in which my name and my presence matters. It matters in this hotel in Thailand. It does not matter in my cult. If I want to connect with that part of me, I must go there to find it. I must find the counterpart. I must find the circle in which the gem becomes illuminated, in which that facet of the psyche comes alive. An identity emerges in relationship to its environment. And since so many of the conversations I long to have, there are no listeners for, except in my mind. I've never met them in 45 years on the planet. But I have seen their restless growings on the inside. Since so many of the conversations that I most yearn to explore are inside with no way to get out. Is there a way to create this dialectic more visibly to at least honor the silence and the death? To at least say this is what's happening in here and it's not what's happening out there. Because I believe that the reason people want to die is that the person they want to be is unwelcome, is un invisible, is low-ranked and met with apathy or hostility in the environment in which they find themselves. And this creates a profound state of helplessness. How can you do the tango in a cult that doesn't dance? And what if doing the tango is where you come alive? How can you find your soul in the sharing of a poem in a cult that does not train the listener on how to receive that gift? How can you drink tea in a tea ceremony with someone who is illiterate of the meanings of the ceremony? How can you revel in a business transaction in which you laid off 10,000 workers while increasing the dividend for, share, for shareholders and boosting the stock 250%. If you are in a town surrounded by workers who are angry at being left off and do not grasp the genius of your ascendancy in a capitalist framework for that conversation, 
You must be with your cronies who can compete to who laid off the most workers, to who mechanized and increased the yield per individual while reducing salaries the most. And that is our game. And these conversations can be had among business owners in our cult and understood and admired, much like the World Bank smiles approvingly as countries take on massive amounts of debt to displace thousands of people and the wheels of the machine turn forward using the metrics provided by the International Monetary Fund. This is a relatively simple structure. We're dealing with the interviewer and we're dealing with one of my identities. Obviously just one among thousands, but you have the basic dialectic. Then you have the counterpoint in witness one and witness two of the conversation. And then you have the witness of the dynamic of these four, conversa these four conversations that are taking place here. And my interest is generally up here. The, the, the area that this gets cut off is when we're in a culture that doesn't get beyond this level. We have the activity, the interaction, and then we have the, the critic, primarily, the judge, the critic. Oh, I didn't like the way he handled that. Well, I thought it was fine. Well, I didn't like the way he did that. I thought that was too much of this thing and thing. And we reference our cult. It's too much of what relative to the cult. Our cult has become uh, massively politically correct in a number of areas, so we have a whole new area to reference on how progressive someone is and is that good or bad and who are we, who do we identify with in the various hierarchies of progressiveness. And um, so we, we, we have this point. But there are large swaths of the conversation not being had and then there are large areas that cannot be debated because the conversation is not being had. But most of all, what I miss is the witness of the meta-conversation, the dialogue about the dialogue in relationship to the possibility field, in relationship to the circle, is the ladder we are climbing leaning against the right tree? And before that conversation can be had, you have to have a conversation, an awareness of many trees to place the ladder against. In a paradigm, of intelligence. Intelligence is the efficiency with which energy, time, money, and natural resources is transformed into human well-being. Energy is actually much broader than that. You can say emotion, attention, anything that takes energy on any dimension. When that is efficiently applied in the generation of sustainable human well-being in an ecological paradigm in which one is not foolish enough to polarize 
the well-being of the host and the well-being of the host body, the body that hosts the individual. Now you can explore artistically and creatively the relative merits, the relative paths, and most interestingly of all, the paths that have never been taken before, the paths to human well-being that are outside the language of current cults and the memes nested within those cults, the dogmas that hold those memes in place. Now you have a conversation worth having, which is which conversation to have, not within the box, but within the circle. Which conversation to have? And that's where I'd like to begin. In a living culture where this conversation could happen with five to ten competent communicators oriented in this domain, a person would be in every chair and the dance could be between the three and yet greater levels. But we'll start the one who's talking is where the red dot is. So we've been outside the frame, talking about the frame, and the frame in the frame. And now we're stepping in to the dialogue. It's a dialogue, and yet you are here, which means it's a trialogue. Every person that gets added to this conversation exponentially increases its dimensionality. And you can create this technology if you break the taboo of chauvinism in the American dogma that says that that which is within is less valuable than that which is without. That subjectivity is for pussies, but objectivity is where it's all at. We're going into subjectivity and stepping outside the cult dogmas. So, Dane, I've been watching this conversation. Well, it's rather, you know, you framed it all very nicely. Where were you hoping to go with this conversation? What were you hoping to emerge? Well, what I'm trying to break through is the, the sense of despair, the sense of depression, that all of the conversations that I'm most interested, interested in having are dying inside before they ever have a chance to come out because there's no one on the opposite side of the table. So tell me what you mean by that. What are the forces that are killing these conversations and what's missing in American culture uh, or Thai culture for that matter? Because uh, I assume you're not having these uh, conversations in Thailand. 
there's a couple of things. This is a glorious attention span for me. Two hours is a perfect amount of time for such a conversation. And I'd personally much rather not have to explain any of this and have someone that got it so we could start off here on a two-hour conversation. But I've never met someone. I've never read about someone that framed things in this way. So it's irrational to conclude that I could take the person I'm speaking with into this domain without this lead up. So it sounds like there's a little frustration in that point of, it, it sounds to me like you're bursting to get on to the conversation and you can't even get to the conversation you can't have because the frame that's needed to have that conversation doesn't exist in this culture. That's exactly right. I'm so glad you get that because the odds of someone getting that, having never experienced it in 45 years, seem impossible to me. That sounds very lonely. How do you feel about that? It's incredibly lonely because I feel like I'm sitting on a gold mine, but nobody knows what gold is. I look at what could be happening, and then I look at what pleases the people around me, what they want from me. And we don't even get to the point where I can explain what gold is. They've got me picking up leaves without the humility to acknowledge that there might be something more valuable than leaves, which then would lead to the question of what that might be, which would then lead to an opportunity without conflict and clumsiness to go into this domain where this conversation and this world could be discovered as a gift And instead, I feel like I'm a burden simply for trying to open the door to the initial humility that there's something more than leaves. That sounds incredibly frustrating. I'm very interested in this. I've also never had a conversation like this. Uh, it's a beautiful tapestry of perception and understanding. And I'm sure you know that the world can be sliced and diced a billion different ways and haven't been broken down into fragments through language and words and meanings that it can then be combined in infinitely more ways. And you have a unique way of slicing and combining things 
and I sense, I see the grief in your face. I see the pain in your face, and I want to know what that pain is about. Well, there's many levels to that pain. But the first level is in the juxtaposition between what you just said and the American way, the Western way. You see, I'm drawn to all of this emotionally. The emotions have the juice. But in a chauvinistic culture, in a chauvinistic culture, the triangle of human experience, which scientifically is clearly heart, mind, and body in equal measures, and I would elevate the human heart above body and mind, for the simple thought experiment that if you can imagine, if you can imagine, you can pick one. You can pick a heart, you can pick a body, or you can pick a mind. Now if you pick a body, you'll be a vegetable, no consciousness. There's no mind and no heart. So you could pick a body. Or you could pick a mind, no body, no heart, so there's no meaning. Because all meaning comes from feeling. All meaning comes from the interplay of pleasure and pain. Meaning, because everyone innately wants to feel good and doesn't want to feel bad, the meaning of a context is framed within that core drive to feel good and not feel bad. The feeling is what gives meaning to the game. Because, let me interrupt you there and ask what the game is. So you're seeing life in terms of a game. What how would you describe the game and the rules that you're referencing there, just so I make sure I understand that? Great question. Life is about creating sustainable life. And human consciousness is part of the flowering of that life. And within human consciousness. Our deepest longing is wholeness, healing, symmetry, grace, joy. Beauty, truth, and goodness are the platonic versions of this. The sphere, a symmetrical shape, is the most elegant shape in the universe. The sphere is the most elegant shape in the universe. So I just want to acknowledge that in American culture, this conversation doesn't get off the ground, in part because there's no frame like this. There's no frame to begin it, and in part because interviewee or interviewer has already got a text and has already interrupted the flow three or four times in physiology that says, I've got to go. There's so many more important things than this. And it takes effort to bring consciousness into uh, this level of creativity. We're creating paradigm, culture, and dialogue on multiple levels. 
which takes incredible skill and presence, which takes a deep longing, a deep awareness of joy and of pain, of healing and of sorrow. It takes an awareness of that to bring this presence to bear. And that wouldn't normally occur with a dopamine addict who's got to check and see what's going on every few minutes. The game of life and creativity is destined to win because life flowering in human consciousness has this innate drive to, at every level, move towards the ideal, to feel good by moving towards wholeness, the symmetry, the beauty, truth, and goodness of that symmetry. Uh, and that feels good as we return to wholeness, as we heal, we feel better. We move towards intelligence, which is synonymous with excellence, which is synonymous with competency, which is synonymous with consciousness, that which we are conscious of, we become more competent about by bringing it into view and participating with it through consciousness. And so we're, we're having a game where the ultimate win is for every consciousness to be intelligent, collaborative, empathic participants in joy, in beauty. And at the pinnacle of that game is fun. So why is fun at the pinnacle? Why do you think that fun is, you know, more important or, you know, more the pinnacle than, than love, say, or excellence? You know, I like excellence. Um, and, you know, it seems, or freedom or something like, why, why put fun as the pinnacle of this particular hierarchy and this particular game. Well, let's look at why you like freedom and why you like excellence. Uh, because it's more fun to be excellent than to be mediocre. It's more fun to have freedom than it is to not have freedom. It's more fun to love than to hate. It's more fun to be transcendent than to be reptilian. And you think of, well, why do you want to move out of the reptilian brain stem towards the limbic brain? Why do you want to move from limbic brain to empathic brain? The first level of the brain, you know, the first levels of the brain are self-centered, like the child. The child definition of love is I, I need. I need you. Every child needs their parent to survive. I need you. And in the abuse contract, this plays out to what do I have to do so that you will take care of me and meet my needs? And there you get the shaping of the cult. So the child is I need you. The adolescent is I want you. I want to touch you. I want to do this. I want this. Self-absorbed. Reptilian brain limbic brain self-absorbed. I have these feelings. The empathic brain, the adult brain of the conscious mind is the first brain that is about the other. Empathy is about the other. Someone who has met their human needs of survival, security, love and belonging, self-esteem, developing their gifts, bringing those gifts abundantly into the world, and being a part of something bigger than themselves naturally turns the attention outward. 
because I've, I've claimed the kingship of the inner domain. I've taken this fragment of the larger ecology and realized its potential. Now I am an adult, and now I turn my attention to you. Now, to you, you are the other. You are the 99.9% .9 of me that I don't know yet, that I can't see. You are the other. And connecting with you allows me in a transcendent state to begin conceptualizing and relating to the possibility and probability of something much bigger than myself. Because if I am the totality of me in this body, I'm all there is. I'm the big one. I now have kingship over me. I have mastered my own psyche by learning to love and serve and heal the child, the adolescent, the young adult, to integrate and combine the warrior, the lover, the various archetypal faces of self. We have become one through the maturity and love of the adult, and I am all that is. So in this paradigm, I'm a big fish in a small pond. But reality is fractal in nature, meaning you can go as far as you want in to a fractal pattern, and you can go as far as you want out of a fractal pattern. It's like a spiral that's endless. So the adult is the totality of the pattern at an individual level. But the adult is the first part of the ego and the psyche that is capable of looking out as a very small particle in a larger rendition of the same fractal pattern at a higher level of resolution, at a higher level of complexity, at a higher level of grace with a higher mathematical value than the ego. So when the ego consciously looks out in relationship to other as the adult, the one who seeks to serve, to attune, and to love, your 99.9% .9 of who I am, I'm now through the self-realization and the touching of the transcendent brain, I'm now beginning, I'm now beginning to see myself as a tiny part of something much bigger with more complexity, which means more variables which means an exponentially higher possibility field. And all possibility fields are neutral. Every possibility field extends to the left and the right equally, above and below equally, extends towards pain and towards healing equally. Every possibility field is equal in its potential. It is neutral. 